Thank you so much for clicking on this video. Welcome aboard. Welcome aboard. Bing bong. Um, today's podcast is gonna be about Polynesia. So Tonga, Samoa, Fiji, and a number of other places. Um, I'm pretty. I'm going back pretty deep. Um, this documentary that I found was like absolutely perfect because it goes back to 950 CE. Usually history, we only could go back so many years, but watching this documentary, I feel like it was very like, I don't know, I'm not saying it was very accurate, but it seems pretty reasonable, you know? Cause when we go back in the past, like how do we know it's the truth, you know? Like, but yeah, out of all the documentaries that I skimmed through, this was to me the best one that represents like to me it represents the polynesian people you know and of course there's going to be a lot of war and clashing and whatnot but one thing i find beautiful about the polynesian culture is the customs the way like the the way they value family and that like each member of the family is, is so important you know like they i can't describe it like i used to play on a rugby team called the oakland warthogs and they were like all Tongan and Samoan and Fijian, you know, there was some mix of other people as well. But that was like my first time ever, like seeing, I guess, the culture, you know, firsthand. And yeah, it was just really amazing. So that's why today I wanted to dedicate this to all my Polynesian people because the history is really beautiful. And I want to give a shout out to my boy Philly. Philly, if you're watching, I appreciate the support, man. You've been you've been you've been giving me a lot of motivation bro whether you believe it or not and your brother Juni too so Juni is Philly's brother so I play rugby with both of them so Juni is like doing his thing right now but this is for y'all man this is for all my Polynesian people <laughs> Let's get to it. But first, before I start off, I just want to say all praises to our Lord. You know, the greatest, the highest, the most merciful. Man, like, seriously. I feel like God is, as we get older, we start realizing more and more of his blessings upon us. So that's what I just want to say. All right, so I just want to give you guys a disclaimer. I'm not so good at pronouncing Polynesian names. To me, it's the most sophisticated things I've ever came upon. Like. It's very beautiful, the language, but the names are so complex. So I'm gonna try my best not to butcher it. All right, so let's do it. Let's let's time travel back to 950 CE in Polynesia. Tui Polotu, which is Fiji, and Tui Manua, which is Samoa, are two ancient maritime powers, which were declining. Aho, Iatu, inspired the Tongan people to create a new empire. <laughs> During that time, uh, Fiji and Samoa were the two ancient powers and they were declining. So that was when, again, Aho Aitu inspired the Tongan people to create a new empire. So Tui, uh, Tui Tonga, which was the emperor, Aho Aitu's father was a Samoan chief, Tangoloa Itumatopua, and his mother was a Tongan nobleman, Ilaheva Vaipopua. So as you guys can see, it's not so easy, uh, but I'm gonna try my best again. So as the, as the heir noticeable to Tui Manua, the Tui Tonga Empire seized control of the former Tui Manua's dominions spread throughout Polynesia. So the Tongan Navy, which Tua Tonga Aho Aitu built, served as the foundation of the maritime empire, protecting trade routes and sending fleets on military expeditions. So the Tongans, I heard were very very great at creating ships that's why they were able to like maneuver around the sea and able to control so much territory and uh, in 950 ce manua's islands 
Because the Tui Manua's dynasty was revered by Tongans and Samoans, the expanding tu Tui Tonga Empire left their dominion, the Moana, the Moanua Teli, alone. So I believe that was like a very um, religious site for them, and it was it was left alone. Thank goodness. And again, 950 CE in Samoa, Monono Island developed into the hub of the empire's shipbuilding, using shipbuilding from Samoa and Marbao wood from Fiji. So Fiji was very um, was very important for wood, I believe. Like their the type of wood they had in Fiji was so important to create, you know, these amazing ships. So master shipwrights named Liha and Limaki were able to build double hulled canoes measuring 25 meters in length when they used premium Morbao wood from Fiji. So imagine at that time creating such canoes as that was like amazing. So imagine people on an island just creating this all from hand scratch before there was like schools like of course they had education but imagine before they had wood shops and all that stuff like these people were able to do that like on their own. So by building stone forts or kolotau on the edges of the islands, the Tongan fleet has established permanent control over the islands. So when you control over the island, you pretty much have dominance. In 1100 CE, when Tui Tonga ruled Fiji, Momo and his son Tuitatui launched an expedition for the Tongan Empire to conquer Tui Fiti Domain. So, again, sorry if I'm butchering these names. Shark teeth were embedded in the clubs, spears, and bows used by the Polynesian warriors, who were also dressed in loincloths, which is also called Maro or Maro. In 1200 CE, Tongan forces led by Tui Tonga Momo conquered Savai'i, an outer Samoan island, and reached the pinnacle of their territorial expansion. So imagine, that's kind of scary, like just going to war with Polynesians. Y'all know how big they are, like, and I don't mean like just to bring up how big they are, but yeah, being on a Polynesian team, like playing rugby, it was just crazy to see how enormous they are, like these big warriors, man. And when they do the haka, it gets crazy. Uh, but moving on. So in 1200 CE, in Tonga Tapu, Tui Tonga in a ritual known as Inasi, Tui uh, tu Itatui demanded tributes from his liegemen in Samoa and Fiji in order to demonstrate his loyalty to Tui Tonga. So yeah, people had to come down and pretty much bow and show their respect and loyalty or else, you know. So Tongan uh, liegemen brought crops, animals, manufactured goods such as mats, bark, cloth, etc. and labor such as servants as tributes during the Inasi. So during the Inasi, you pretty much had to show your loyalty. You had to give up like, you know, valuable stuff, you know? So yeah, that's pretty much a lot of customs back then. It was always like giving stuff to the, to the rulers, you know? So something very normal. So both Tongans and Samoans are expert weavers. Tongans made exquisite waist cloths, which is called the Tata Ovala, while Samoans produced exquisite mats or Itoga. In 1200 CE, in Tonga Tapu, the Tongans are master builders. Tu Itatui gave the order to construct the Langi royal tomb. I think Langi means sky. Huge tome hills made from huge limestone slab. So these people are carrying stones. Like, just imagine. Like, it's crazy. I wouldn't be able to do that. Like, I'm only like 5'7". <laughs> I'll probably be able to carry a couple pebbles. <laughs> so these Polynesians were carrying mountains on a back it's crazy so polynesians had previously created intricate social hierarchies most notably through the matai system that pretty much prioritized like um not people based on seniority but people based on ability and like what they can do nowadays like you just see like people just with seniority have power but these people of seniority don't have any like knowledge such as like biden you know like he's our president but I feel like he's just president due to his seniority, you know? What in the hell is he talking about? But whatever, moving on. Polynesian people also farmed taro, yams, and ufi. 
Additionally, they produce tapa, a bark cloth that is used in Polynesian uh, textiles. So, yeah, they were they they were going to work. They knew their land, you know. Trade flourished under unified Tongan rule, with goods like crops, animals, and stone tools being exchanged from Fiji to Rarotonga. So the Tongan shipbuilders construct the Kalia, a double-hulled canoe with a single enormous sail that can accommodate up to 100 people. The largest model is 33 meters long. So making a canoe that fit up to 100 people, imagine Polynesians, they were not small people, these were big people. So carrying 100 of these warriors meant a lot. So having these canoes and being able to go around with 100 soldiers, like... Just imagine you are like you're on your island and you see some canoes with like hundred Polynesians doing a haka looking at you like doing a little scary face. I'll start running. <laughs> um, but moving on. So in 12 at 1250 CE in Samoa, as Tui Tonga Talakafaiki moved to Savai'i and named Lautovunya as the island's governor, discontent in Samoa increased. So political stuff was going on during that time during the years that i'm talking about so this is when politics can get a little dangerous samoans rebelled against the tongan empire led by tuna fata and savea and ambushed tui tonga talaka faiki and his bodyguard so yeah the samoans were like nah we're not gonna do this no more we're gonna take control and yeah they did that and after losing Talakafaiki referred to the rebels as Malai Toa, or Great Warriors, after Tongans are expelled from Samoa, but both parties pretty much reconciled after. So, yeah, I believe Samoa, you know, took control back. In 1400 CE, in Tonga Tapu, the Tui Tonga Empire was centralized and faced political turmoil, with the murder of successive emperors of Tonga, including Takalua. Havea the first and Havea the second. So it wasn't a good time for Tonga during these times. In 1450 CE in Yukvea, the heir of Takalua assumed the throne as Kalufanua Tui Tonga. So by pursuing the rebels and assassins who shielded them, he swears to exact revenge on his father. So yeah, there is a lot of revenge going on right now as you guys can see. So I believe as Takalua took the throne, Tonga, he was destined for retaliation and control so Kau Olofanua brutally murdered the assassins earning the nickname Kaulu Faunu Fakai or Kau Alafonua I hope I pronounced that right which means the savage one I feel like I'm gonna be fluent in Polynesian if that's how you guys say it in 1470 CE in Tonga Tapu sensing the need for power sharing Tui Kau Alafonua gave his brother Mo Ungamatua the position of Hau, which is the chief minister in politics. So this was like a pretty big move. So like they sensed that they needed power because Tonga was like, I'm not saying fall up, falling apart, but they needed to gain some momentum. So they started like spreading the power among other people of the family. So later, Mo Ungamatua established the position of Tui Ha Atakalua, or prime minister. And additionally, Kaulafanua named strong governors for each of the main islands. And in order to forge political ties and, pres and persevere peace, Tongan royalty also encourages interfaith unions amongst Tongan, Samoan, and Fijian nobility. So yeah, I think that was a really smart move because a lot of cultures you guys can see, they just have them marry among their own race. So during all this tension that you guys are seeing or hearing, one way for them to like resolve this issue was to allow interface marriages. So you can have Tongan, Samoan, Fijian family members. Like, so there's, like I said, there's no tension against the races, but I still made that mistake one time when I was playing rugby and I called someone Samoan when they were Tongan and I learned it the hard way. Just had to say that. <laughs> so make sure you guys don't just go out assuming people's ethnicities, just ask them. So moving on, this is pretty much the last the last point. In, in 1550 CE in Tonga Tapu, the empire underwent further decentralization when Tui Ha Atakalua, the prime minister, created the new position of Tui Kanakopolu. So, and who knows what happens after in history, but that's how far I was able to get up to. From 950 CE all the way to 
1550 CE. So I just find the Polynesian history really interesting because you guys can all see like throughout all of our histories, there was a time when everyone lived in peace. There was like, you know, enough land for everyone. But it's just crazy as like, I don't know if it's due to supply and demand or intimidation, but like we end up like clashing. But through the clashing and through the wars, we always try to find reconciliation. We always try to find these treaties to sign and whatnot. But yeah, I find the Polynesian culture very beautiful. And one thing about the Polynesian culture that I find very, very honestly inspiring is that no one's left behind. Like everybody in their family. I know there, of course, there's tension in our family. I'm not saying every family is perfect, but they realize the power of not leaving anyone behind, no matter the flaws they have, you know, like I've seen that firsthand experience, you know, through like all my friends and their lives. So again, Polynesian culture is so beautiful. So I just want to say thank you guys so much for tapping into this video. I hope you guys liked it. And again, history is beautiful. So I just feel like history is so beautiful because it just shows how far we've come as humans. And it shows us that even through war, like we still find a way to come together and you know, it's very interesting. But all right, thank you guys so much for watching this video. Have a beautiful day or night. God bless. And please pursue your dreams. If you're not pursuing your dreams, at least visualize it in your head so it can come into fruition. Because everyone should pursue their dreams. Everyone. But yeah, just thank you so much again for watching this video. Hope to see you next time.